Thank you. I'm going to try to be loud enough. Public speaking and then being in front of audience is certainly not the forte of chefs behind closed doors usually. So um, welcome. Good morning. I'm going to try not to make you guys too hungry. I realize it's breakfast time. Um, <laughs> but I am at fault for bringing a few food-related props today. Um, magic, as we talked about, uh, it was an interesting approach when I was approached for this. Um, I had to think about it for a minute to how does that apply to us, right? And then you start thinking about where sort of the surprise is in restaurants and how you see what we do and how you don't see what we do until it comes to your table. So I started putting two and two together, and I was like, wow, that's you know, the drinks, the food, the, the service even, the, you know, the surprise of what we do. Um, I guess it is very magical. But that's not the only part of magic in our business. Um, there's a lot of magic in the customer interaction, too, the, uh, the experience, the, um, the transformation of attitudes in the course of a day or, and then into dinner when you come in, some people can be so very one way, I'll say, either angry or distraught or focused on being mad. And then we turn their day around in a very short period of time and very happy. To me, that's the magical part. Um, so uh, I want to talk a little bit about that today. I also want to talk a little bit about um, the institution that is restaurants and how they apply to our staff. Um, how they apply to career opportunities, and, and, and it's actually, you know, not to be redundant, but pretty magical that people of all walks of life can come in, learn a skill set, take it with them for the rest of their career, and use it to make a living. Um, that's something as an educational institution, it is, uh, is really quite unique. Um, a little bit about myself. Um, I started cooking at the young age of 14, really, back then. Back then. We were able to work then. Uh, and this sounds like so long ago, I'm actually not that old, but um, uh, I grew up in a real small rural shrimping and fishing community in South Louisiana, uh, so tiny town. People were literally living off the land and the water, the bayous. It was where the end of the road is in Louisiana. If you picture the boot, the tip of the toe that is the boot of Louisiana, uh, like the, the road, concrete road stops, and then it turns into shells, and then it turns into just dirt. Um, that's about as far as they go. Bayou boys, they call it, down the road, down the baya, they say down there. Um, so I was a little uncivilized, I guess you could say, but I thought everybody ate like we did. Fresh seafood, fresh crabs, live fish, freshly caught right off the road. You know, I thought that was the whole world. I didn't really know that you couldn't just go up to a guy at the side of the road selling shrimp off the side of a pickup, out of a pickup truck for three bucks a pound. <laughs> I thought that was everything, right? So um, that's just how we did. Uh, but um, as I've grown, I've realized how special that was and um, what an influence that was on my career. Uh, my dad, at a young age, thought I needed to work, which was probably good for me. Um, so he threw me in the back door of a restaurant at uh, 14, 15 years old, started dishwashing. Um, I was obviously a secondary helper because I probably wasn't very fast or organized at that age. Um, then one day the busboy quit. Mother's Day, I think it was. And they're like, hey, can you do that? And I'm like, yeah, sure, I'll do that. So we went outside and uh, started clearing plates and stuff and realized that people were shoving dollar bills in my pocket. I was like, wow, this is cool, too. <laughs> I could be, yeah, it looked cash money, you know, at that age. Um, and then, you know, the prep guy, you know, started doing a little prep. And then uh, one day, like, the fry cook left, didn't show up or something. The guy was like, can you do that? I was like, yeah, I could do that. So that was the big deal, right? Cooks are the rock stars in the kitchen world. They're out drinking, come in with stories, regaling their adventures, you know, hungover. They're like, eh, you know. Um, they were the big shots. So to be with them at, you know, was, a, was, a, was, a, was a real treat, I guess you could say. Probably exposed me to a few things that I probably shouldn't have been. Um, but nonetheless, it was a, it was a great experience. And when you, once you reach, tap into something like that, the instant gratification of creating something from a raw product, instantly, it's just like learning to tie your shoes, right? It's like, aha, this is awesome. And it becomes a little addictive, right? You want to learn more, and then you progress, and you're like, you get better at it, your repetitions, your execution, and then all of a sudden, you're like, man, I can freaking really be good at this. Um, so I decided that it was going to be my go-to. 
I did a little construction, did a little you know, regular uh, other small jobs, mechanics and auto parts and stuff. But pretty much cooking was it. I went to school for medicine. I went to Southeast Louisiana University, studied biological sciences. I love science. I love chemistry. And um, got about 95% of the way through that and realized plan B was definitely going to be plan A. Uh, you know, I love science and I love medicine. And, but something about the um, seeing people at their worst every day in medicine versus seeing people at their best joyous occasions, celebrations, just really interested in what you're doing was the turning point for me. It was something that to make the decision of what I was going to do and see people either happy and make people happy every day or having to see people at their worst and hopefully be able to make it better for them um, was the big decision maker for me. So after cooking through college and deciding that I wanted to see a little bit more of America, I traveled all throughout the South to sort of, at the time, it was just for adventure and new, um, but I didn't realize that I was augmenting my skill set. Um, in these different locales, you see different approaches to people, you see different types of people, you see um, different types of organizations, big and small, everything from a, you know, a $40 million food and beverage operation to something as tiny as a mom and pop Italian steakhouse where the one guy would stand in there, he would only cook the steaks, Blaise Gazzardo was his name, and uh, he would, had one eye, glass eye, and he would say, all right, nobody touched the steak, and he'd have a cigarette, and he's smoking while he's cooking steaks, and you know, little tiny places like that that are probably not existing anymore. Um, but you learn a lot of experience, uh, basically. And then uh, when I decided to take it seriously, I, went to, I moved to Texas, Houston, Texas. I worked for a big country club there, and I was an apprentice for the Culinary Olympic team for the United States, uh, which was um, a great experience because it showed me that there was a different level to what we were doing. It was not just the Mach 2, hair on fire, badass cook, hair backwards, trying to do, make things as big and as saucy as you could. It was, there was a real professional attitude toward it. And a, 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 uh, a level of education and serious attention to detail that I was not familiar with. So at that point, I decided to actually go back to school and culinary school. I went to Johnson & Wales. I grad told my dad I was going to go and graduate number one. He says, <laughs> okay, we'll see. <laughs> and, uh, and I did. So I went to Johnson & Wales, Providence, Rhode Island. And as with anything later in life, you tend to take it a little more seriously. Um, I went in with a, with a small bit of experience, but theories to be proven. Um, things that I thought were correct that I really wanted just ratified. Um, and when I got there, I had, luckily, there was some incredible instructors that did just that. They forced me into a hyper-focus on what I needed to make better. There were classes on leadership and mentorship and costing and the things that you don't think about as a cook. You think that it's all just kissing babies and making steaks. Well, the reality is it's very not. It's very, um, there's a big, huge uh, business acumen behind it. And now as an owner, I can appreciate those lessons. Um, so from there, I took a couple jobs in some private clubs. Uh, my first of which was real serious mentorship role was as a, an executive sous chef at a country club in Rochester and with a staff of 30. And I didn't realize how individual leadership is and how management is so psychological to the one person that I started to think about my approach to people because I was running into some problems. How do you motivate people? How do you, um, how do you lead with someone that you have nothing in common with, right? How do, you, um, how do you problem solve when there's two people that you don't understand their differences? Um, so I started to think about that in leadership roles and uh, how, that go, how that goes and pertains to the kitchen environment. And it actually was something that I had picked up along the way and I just didn't realize. I was always the person that could get along with the entire staff. You know, it's very easy going and just, non-confrontational really, I mean to a certain extent, but you know, also non-judgmental. And when you open yourself to that, then you realize that there's a lot of opportunities. I took the chef job at the Park Country Club um, in 2007, so I, and I was the executive chef, my first executive chef job at, the, um, at that level, and instantly I realized I was a little in over my head. Um, it, was a, it was a big job, but as with anything, you work, you learn, you master, you execute, and I think that has been my mantra throughout the entire career and just really kind of discovered it in the last 10 years or so. Um, it was a great opportunity. It was a, a, a big place. People were, had to win the customer base and then also please them on a daily basis, come up with be exciting and new and innovative. Um, 
it was, a, it was a really great experience for me to work so closely with 500 member families in a closed membership club. Um, but I still needed a little more. And then Teuton, right? Anybody here been to Teuton? Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Uh, fried chicken, maybe? Fried dish, favorite dish, yeah, yeah, shrimp and grits is my personal favorite right now. There's our staff. So this is a cute picture of our entire staff. So Teuton came about as just an idea. Actually, another employee of mine was talking about how he was going to open a restaurant. And he's talking about, and I had never really considered it. I mean, I think the chef's dream at the end of the, their career is always to have something that they can do to express their wants and what they want to do and how they want to do it and what they want to serve and just treat people the way they want to be treated. I never really thought of it as a reality. I was just kind of like, um, you know, maybe one day. Well, this guy really uh, was hard up on it. He was, he was real, uh, like focused. He had a plan. And I was just listening, listening, listening. And I was like, man, that'd be a maybe good idea. Well, not so long after that, somebody came to me and said, hey, we got this spot downtown we'd like you to come look at. And I was like, all right, OK, you know, I'll go look at it. My business plan was like a word outline like this. <laughs> And literally, and now that I, when I look back on what I gave that guy that day, I'm surprised he even really even took me seriously. Um, but uh, that project has been very, very magical. And that, for me, is um, going to be a big part of what I want to talk about today. Because the, from going to something, literally a lunch meeting, turned into what is now something that we live and breathe every day, uh, it, was, it was very special. Um, I didn't know how to go about it. I didn't know what things, didn't, certainly didn't have the funds to, to really look at it. I mean, it, you managed to come up with them sooner or later. But the, um, the cliff, I say, to, of walking off that edge, of saying that now I'm going to go into business for myself and give up what I know to be a standard paycheck, a stability in my life, to know that that sort of employment will be there, whether I am or not, or whether um, anything happens or whatever, is a big, big deal for us. Um, the idea was I hated not having any southern food in Buffalo. I found myself making po'boys and muffalettas and gumbo for myself and my staff, and then friends would stop by, and then we did a couple Crawford's Bowls in my backyard, and they were like, wow, why don't we have this? So I was like, this is instant, instant, this is going to be it. This is too southern, right? My grandfather's camp was named Teuton. It was something they always called it. It was literally like a hunting and fishing shack, maybe about the size of this room, right here, just this corner, um, that they worked in and out of when they were out in the marsh as a shelter, really, for transporting the pelts and fish and stuff from the day's catch. Um, but it wasn't almost, it almost wasn't was. Obviously, we were, uh, I kicked around. I really love Japanese food a lot, too. I really love like Japanese yakitori and ramen. Has anybody got any fans of that in here? Yeah, yeah. So Teuton was almost a Japanese restaurant as well. but Because uh, you're like, oh, yeah, that's a good idea. No. Um, I don't have the pedigree for that, really. Uh, but the process that um, made Teuton what it is was something that was, uh, I, I thought <laughs> was kind of a rabbit out of a hat, right? So that's why I wanted to include that part of it. Um, I basically showed up in chef coats and a hoodie one day in front of a business loan officer and kind of poked my head in and was like, hey, anybody talk about small business financing? And they're like, oh, yeah, come in, come in. I was like, well, no, 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 no. I just want to know who to talk to. I'm not ready. I didn't bring anything with me. He's like, no, come in, come in, come in. So I sat down and he's like, tell me about, tell me about it. So I started talking about what I wanted to do and he could obviously see it oozing out of my pores about how much it meant to us, what we were trying to do in Buffalo. And uh, he's like, you know what? Come back tomorrow. Tell exactly what you told me. I'm going to bring somebody in. So I go in the next day, this time, obviously, appropriately dressed uh, with, and prepared, and, uh, and, and spoke to a person um, who's a vice president of finance at M&T, and they were really just, you know, master of the living room type of stuff. I, was, I just gave them my whole spiel. I was like, I put it all on the table. I was like, this is all I got, right? I just have an idea, and I know we can do it well, and I know it's going to be a big deal for the city. And they believed in us, and that, to me, was, was very energizing that we could... Um, partner with someone that would make our dream come true. The business model, um, as any of you know, a business is the uh, forecasting and stuff involved in financial acumen. Everybody thinks that it's just, like I said, just kissing babies and making mistakes. Unfortunately, it is not. It is um, a very volatile business model. You're dealing with highly perishable products that are, have, have a limited appeal, and then there's a production level 
in that model before you reach the final stage where you have to literally transform raw ingredients. That's too taunt prior to being what it is today. <laughs> yeah, that's the basement, what it looked like before we got in it, before we got in it. And I think there's one right after. So this is us cleaning it, right? So um, you literally have to transform raw products into a final dish that people will pay for. So when we get cases of radicchio and arugula and tomatoes and peppers and chickens and whole pigs and all those things, you have to then apply everything you know to get it to the table before it goes bad, obviously, in per, hopefully, in premium condition. And along the way, there's seven or eight different hands in that process, sometimes a lot more, to get to you, to the idea of what you think. Now, if I say, if I say pork chop to you, right, what do you think of? Uh, right, right now, yeah? If I say pork chop to you, 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 you think of a pork chop on a plate, right? Maybe grilled, maybe seared, maybe with some sort of sauce on it, maybe some accompaniment. Well, when I see pork chop, I see the middle of a pig, right? Like, so, like, <laughs> the belly, the loin, the T-bone, the and how do I get that pork chop out of there and then get it to you on the plate? How do we cook it perfectly? How do we serve it at the right temperature? What accompaniments are you going to like and enjoy? And then... If you're even in the mood for the pork chop that day, how many do we make, right? So we serve 100 people. Do we have 100 pork chops or do we have five? Do we have eight? Do we have nine? Do we have 15? Um, so there's a, lot of <laughs> there's a lot of magic in that, the forecasting of what we do, and then the production. Um, again, Teuton, at this building's phase, uh, when we took over that building, it was a, a tavern on the first floor. I mean, you guys know the story. There was a Billy O's Golden Swan. Anybody drink there ever? Yeah, uh, I hear a lot of stories of, of people who were in their 30s that were like, I used to drink there when I was 15. <laughs> Billy, easy, buddy. Um, there was a boarding house upstairs above the restaurant. It was 11 apartments. Uh, when we got the building, it was, um, it was vacant for like three years, and it had been, part of it had been collapsed. It had been void of plumbing and electrical and sewage for that time. There were some squatters, obviously. Some people had taken over the building as their home. And it was a real, real mess. And so what you see today as Teutant was a vision that I had and literally had to trust it. We had to know that it was going to be great. And we literally, nobody could have predicted that it was going to be as beautiful as it is. Tables and what you see today. Um, that is magical to me to see now knowing what I saw, stripping something that's 100 years old completely down and then turning it into something new and amazing. The problem is when you take a building apart like that, you start getting a little romantic about how much you like what you see and what you'd like to save. Uh, so it became a much bigger construction project than uh, we anticipated. Um, the good part about it is People nowadays pay a ton of money to put that look into buildings. We just uncovered it. That was Buffalo. Originally, 100 years ago, the brick, the exposed joist, I mean, certainly not the exposed ductwork like it is today. But now we'll get to the good stuff. Bar before, and then the bar after, right? Beautiful. The building prior, new windows installed, and then now what it looks like today. A real magic act. That was, I mean, literally an amazing transformation. And when I see people enjoying it every day today, when I see people enjoying it every day today, I see the joy and the, what, what, what it brings to people. It's, it's really special to me that we were able to do that. Um, where the magic happens in our business, the cooking, obviously, we talked about. <laughs> um, you guys know that one, right? Uh, the cooking. So I talked about the product, making the product from a raw product to an end product. It is literally chemical transformation. It is applying seasonings and and uh, temperature at the right ratio to make sure that you have something perfect and edible and amazing and, and that the, what people want at the, in a minute's notice. The other magic is the process. You order it, it comes to your table. Like a vending machine, right? The, I mean, you, <laughs> right? I mean, literally, you're looking at a menu going, man, this thing would be great. And then you, 10 minutes later, sometimes 15, it comes up just the way you envisioned it. To me, that is really amazing. Uh, the guest experience. We talked about the happiness where you change people. In no other business can I feel, do I feel that you can change someone's life? Literally, turn their completely day around in a, such a short period of time. 
I mean, as I said, people can come in mad, angry, tired, overworked, hangry. We get a lot of that. <laughs> uh, but, you, you know, they're in some kind of way. And then just a, one cocktail, an appetizer, a little bit of dinner, some good company, some good conversation. Next thing you know, that person is really feeling it. They are now in the mode that you intended them to be. To me, that is probably the most magical part about our business is the, literally the people, the way you can transform someone's minute. And I don't think there's really very many other businesses you can do that. The fried chicken, this was funny. The fried chicken birthday cake. <laughs> Someone requested that. We don't do too many of them. Bologna, bologna sandwiches. Ah, uh, yeah, see? Uh, soft shore crabs. And then the final dish. I think the other part of the guest experience that we don't talk about is the connections. The, um, the social interactions in the bar, obviously that's great. We make that a little easier with a few cocktails and a, and a little bit of whiskey. Um, but the social connections, what you make, what people feel about how they, when they walk into a room that has this vibe of communal joy and celebration, automatically you can feel it. And that's what, you know, that's what we try to create. I mean, that's what we strive for. Um, the other thing is the connection at the table, the dinner conversation, something that's lost today really in America, I think, is in a restaurant, you know, you have, it's just you. Really, I mean, you have a bunch of other people around you, but the reality is your little table unit is just you. So the connections you make, the conversations, the business meetings, those type of relationships, I mean, they are, it's, it's, it's a vessel for creating those relationships, and that's what I really love about it. The magic of cocktails. Uh, well, I think we can all, it's pretty self-explanatory how, how that works. Um, building the potions, though, is what we call it, right? So like having the drinks made, using the spirits and, and creating something that is flavorful and tasty and everything, but that some people will enjoy, is a real trick. I mean, it's, uh, if you ever watch those guys work, it's a, it's a chemistry experiment, and especially in accuracy. To have something balanced, unique, flavorful, not overpowering, you know, you're not gonna get hammered obviously, on, on one or two or whatever. Um, hurricanes are not like that, but. Uh, the, Social interaction that we talk about, and then so the one thing that I didn't touch on we, a little bit was the education center that is the, the restaurant. I take great pride in mentoring our people, especially what we have now as a culinary team. They're usually young people that have uh, uh, chosen this career because of celebrity status or what they um, see on TV, or they realize what they don't realize is there's a 50-hour work week of lifting heavy boxes and running up and down the stairs and working in intense environments environments and heat, a deadline and actual physical labor. Um, but it's a way, a system for people to learn a skill set that they can take with them and really grasp and master technique and approach to food. And to me, that environment is something that's very precious. It is um, on the job training in production, but it's also a, a transfer of knowledge, a, a, a legacy, if you will. People take what you teach them and move on and grow and then become their own sort of um, ambassador of that particular idea. And, you know, I think we can all use a little more of that. I think that, you know, having someone show you a, a way to do something and what, why, how, why not to do is the big one. What, what happens if you do it this way? What happens if you don't do it this way um, is, a, is a big deal. And it's, it's a big deal to me. Um, The real magic, what do you got there? Country ham? Piggies? There's your country ham, as we know it. Yeah, beautiful. Bacon, anybody got a bacon fan in here? The ham sandwich. And then our ham salad, which is amazing. It's tough to stay grounded, right, to um, so many people in the culinary and in restaurants feel as though what they're doing is good enough and they sort of start to rest on their success, right? Anybody here done something and been like, really, wow, that's really good, and then just kind of be like, that's it, right? It's, to me, you have to kind of keep your foot on the gas. I mean, you, um, you can rest in your success, you can acknowledge that it's great, and I've said this before, it's, it's nice to do that, but now how do we get better? How do we move on? How do we continually innovate and stay creative and stay unique and you know, attractive, really, to a customer base that is very, very public and very fickle. Um, 
there's a lot of magic in that. And it's not just planning, it's ideas, it's collaboration, it's listening to your people, it's understanding that any idea is a good idea, even if it's the idea of what not to do, right? Understanding, learning the way that everyone sees it, because you may have an idea of what something is, and you may have an idea of what something is, and then I didn't see it that way. You know, I, I love the communal learning environment. I think the kitchens are ideal, and even the service end of it is an ideal way for a uh, new environment for that to blossom. The people, the staff, as I showed you my staff photo in the beginning, that's our little birthday toast there. You're only as good as the people you surround yourself with, and I am lucky that people have chosen us to be our steward in their employment, and you know, to me, they are the real magic makers. You surround yourself with great people who are driven, who are honest, who are fair, and make great decisions, that is what I think is the secret to success. I, it is really the only saving grace we have because anybody can be stubborn and closed-minded about what they want to do. When you have great people behind you, they can pick you up, they can support you, they can show you things that you didn't see before, and um, you know, you're just, I feel like I'm just blessed, obviously, because our team is so amazing, and the magic that happens there on a daily basis is because of every single one of them. You can't do it alone. The last thing I have is, <laughs> not sausage, it is. Uh, there's our bacon and sausage, uh, red beans and rice, jambalaya, right? And then again, the new cheddar jalapeno sausage, that's always fun, you haven't had that. Uh, turkey sausage, and then we see some more products, and I'll scroll through a couple of these through the question and answer. So, but I just want to say, the last thing, and I want to say the most important, I feel, the best advice anybody ever gave me was to outwork, outthink, and outhumble the next guy. And I try to maintain that with our staff, because being gracious, being humble, but being driven and passionate about what you do is where the real magic happens. Everybody can say that we have this beautiful environment of the restaurant. We have this beautiful restaurant. People are going to come there. We have great drinks. People are going to come there. Um, you know, we have fried chicken, we have biscuits, we have things that people want already, but that's a one-time transaction. Really staying passionate about what you do, grounded, humble, and really just working your literal tail off every single day to be the better than you were the minute before is where magic really happens. And I think, I think that's the only formula to success, I really do. I mean, it's, it's something that we hold very dear and we constantly repeat it in our mantra every single day is you're nothing without the people, without the people that choose you, whether it be your staff or your customer, the guest, all day. And if you don't live up to your end of the promise of that, of that transaction, of that trust, the honor of feeding them and nourishing them, the safety part of it, the the, the, it's, it's a real honor, and I think that's it. I think that, you know, that is, to me, the most magical part of this business, and I hope that you understand a little bit about where I'm coming from and what we do, because I wouldn't want to be doing anything else. I mean, it is, it is really amazing that we get to serve people like that every single day and make people happy. I ask my son every day, he, he says, Daddy's going to work. Mama says, Daddy's going to work. Daddy, he goes, no, Daddy's going to make people happy. <laughs> so um, thank you all very much. We're going to have a few questions. <laughs>